So <clears throat> this morning we have two live sessions. So the first one being like uh, online, so it will be uh, my scrammer. We'll be talking uh, a lot about uh, symbolic regression. And the second one will be uh, by Jens Jascha. Uh, but uh, uh, yes. But, uh, yes, thanks. <laughs> so my scrammer here. And the second one later on in the morning, so at 11.30. So it will be by Jens Jascha about uh, machine learning and Bayesian inference. Um, Miles, so you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Hear me? Yes. Um, so I will give you, uh, like, as usual, like, let's say, 45 minutes plus, let's say, five minutes, more or less buffer. And then I will give you an indication on Slack uh, or visual cues if, uh, <laughs> if needed. Okay, sounds good. Okay, go ahead. Right. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. Sorry I couldn't attend in person. I have to uh, teach today, so uh, yeah, I couldn't come. Um, so I am so I'm currently at uh, University of Cambridge, an assistant professor. I work kind of broadly on uh, kind of uh, machine learning, astrophysics, physical sciences in general. So today I'm going to talk about um, symbolic regression in particular uh, as a kind of like an interpretable machine learning tool. Okay, so I'll just, I like to start out just by kind of um, framing this in terms of like my motivations. So what I want, I want an AI scientist. Um, and I think, so, so I want a way to actually automate the research process itself. I think machine learning research is, um, it's driven mostly by computer vision and natural language processing, right? Like this is <clears throat> the driving force behind a lot of the most recent uh, innovations. And those themselves are motivated by industry interests, um, robotics, uh, you know, attempts to reach like human level performance at, at say image classification. But the problem with this, idea is that um, I think we kind of put ourselves in that box of, okay, computer vision, natural language processing, developed by industry for industry tasks. Now we take those algorithms and just swap the data sets with scientific data sets. So I think this is uh, what I view as kind of a, a problem because like fundamentally what I want and probably others want is I, I want a way of automating scientific research. Um, and so I, I think we can kind of uh, start from kind of like take a step back and kind of try to figure out, okay, what do we actually want? Uh, and how can we, you know, use, I guess, machine learning methods as a, as a way to do that. So um, instead of say computer vision or natural language processing i want machine learning to reach human level performance at, at doing research in the natural sciences so this is kind of my driving goal um and i think for that to happen right natural science it's not a regression problem this is kind of this is kind of one of the issues i have with uh the use of machine learning science is we we kind of like computer vision natural language processing um those are industry problems and you can pose them well as regression, right? Like you want to predict customer sentiment, right? So that's kind of like the final goal. And if you do that, you are successful. But in science, like regression is not really, if I kind of view it as not the fundamental goal, I think we, we want an understanding of, uh, of like why we make a prediction. And I think, to use machine learning to kind of discover new concepts uh, and represent them in uh, kind of human understanding, I think we should have a way of representing them in uh, our language. So, um, so this is a uh, yeah. So this is kind of the motivating principle. Um, I think maybe how we can do this. So if we look at how the traditional approach to, um, I guess, scientific discovery, maybe you have some data set, you have like low dimensional statistics of that data set that you kind of drive by hand and you 
build up a theory that kind of describes the data. Um, I think, so if you look back at a lot of our theory, a lot of the, um, I mean, so like, just look at Kepler's third law, right? So this was an empirical observation, all right? So this is like a human interpretable empirical observation. Newton's law of gravitation was, uh, it was kind of inspired to predict this law. Um, similarly, Planck's law, right? It's it's actually an empirical fit to data. Um, and this was partially kind of motivated quantum mechanics to help explain it. Um, but if we have if we have just like parameters in a neural network, we don't really get that, right? So we miss out on um, what I view as kind of like the 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 main thing we're after, right? We're not trying to solve regression problems. We're trying to understand the universe. So we should probably focus on that rather than taking computer vision, natural language processing, swapping the data set. Um, so if I if I just have like neural network parameters, I don't really get that. Um, so maybe one approach, um, and by the way, this is all subjective, just like arguments. <laughs> so maybe one approach to uh, attack this is maybe with machine learning, we can kind of use the neural network as a as what it's good at, which is kind of compressing data and finding relationships in high dimensional data sets. And then the understanding step is maybe like a like a distillation of the neural net, like trying to rather than trying to describe the theory directly, maybe you use the neural network to find patterns and then you try to describe those patterns uh, with your theory. So maybe that's one uh, potential approach to this problem. Um, by the way, I'm happy to take questions throughout the talk if people want. Um, I can't see the audience. So I don't know if anybody's raising their hand. So you could just shout at me, and hopefully I'll hear it. Yeah, we'll we'll probably go through directly like this, and in Slack there will be a thread anyway. So yeah. Oh, there's a thread. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, question. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. I see. Okay. Uh, great. So the key point of this talk is neural networks trained on big data sets. They can find new insights. Uh, but the remaining challenge is actually distilling those insights into our language. Like, how do we actually understand what the neural network has learned? And <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about interpretability in general, symbolic regression, this idea that we've kind of termed um, symbolic distillation, kind of like this interpretation strategy. Uh, I'm going to give some examples and then talk about uh, potential future uh, work. So the, the kind of the traditional strategy of interpretability in computer vision, natural language processing is it all usually involves this idea called feature importance. So it's basically just looking at what part of your data was the most uh, informative for a prediction. So the simplest way to do that is if you have an image classifier of, say, lions and dogs, you look at the gradient with respect to the data. Take a gradient with respect to the data, and that tells you kind of the sensitivity of your classifier. So um, this is obviously like, it, it's uh, it works for many different problems, right? Because you can always kind of take that gradient, uh, but it, again, it kind of misses the, the actual, uh, like, like what you're doing with the features, and that's kind of what, um, is maybe more important for science. Uh, so you can do this. So there's this uh, algorithm called LIME. Uh, I always forget what it stands for. It's like lo locally, locally interpretable something model. It's like our locally independent model something. I don't know. But it's like uh, you basically fit a local linear model to your, say, complex neural network. And you use that as a tool to kind of explain, okay, this part of the image influenced the output uh, in this way. <clears throat> so if I have this image of this nice uh, golden retriever playing a guitar, um, and I want to classify it, if my classifier predicts electric guitar, 
and I build like a line model to that, maybe it will say, okay, this is the part that's highlighted kind of the most influential on that prediction. If I predict acoustic guitar, it gives me that part. Um, and then, oh, it's a Labrador. Uh, my image classifier is not good at dogs. <laughs> and if it's a Labrador, it shows the face. Um, so again, this is like a course interpretability strategy it's used in computer vision, natural language processing. Um, recently, people are getting into something called mechanistic interpretability a bit, <clears throat> um, which is more actually focusing on how these models predict uh, the things they predict. I think it's still not at the level of uh, where we would want it for science, but I, I think it's like an interesting direction. Um, and I think, so I think in general, like science, we already have a modeling language. We don't need to use this kind of course feature importance idea. Computer vision, okay, you don't have an equation for a dog or a cat, right? But in science, we do have a modeling language and that is simple symbolic expressions, right? So this is, I think this is kind of like an obvious way of interpreting models in machine learning is to fit or, or kind of discover analytic models that describe data. Um, so like you can look at any physics cheat sheet and it's just all simple analytic equations and they're very descriptive of many systems. Um, so <clears throat> another cool thing about this is, um, so on a paper with, uh, so this is a paper with uh, Alvaro Sanchez Gonzalez, Peter Battaglia, Shirley Ho, David Spergel, uh, Rui Zhu, and Kyle Kramer. So this was a paper that we had where we basically trained a graph neural network on, uh, I think it was Kyote, the Kyote data set, trying to predict the dark matter density at different points. Um, and what we did was we trained the graph neural network at for only the lightest dark matter halos. Okay, so we did like a cut on the dark matter halos and only trained the graph neural network to predict those. Then what we did is we approximated the uh, basically we approximated the neural network with a symbolic expression. Um, and we tested, so the symbolic expression, it was a bit worse in terms of like training accuracy compared to the graph neural network. But then what we did is we tried extrapolating to higher mass dark matter halos and the graph neural network kind of did like crap and the symbolic expression generalized like pretty well. Um, so it seems like even though that's not really the true expression for that problem. Um, it's kind of like a really good prior on the space of models. If you can express it as like a simple equation in terms of the operators that are common in physics, um, it tends to be, I think, just like a stronger prior over the space of models. I think when we, like, I think when scientists train neural networks, <clears throat> a kind of fallacy that I see often is that we assume neural networks are kind of like a neutral prior. They're not a neutral prior. They are a very particular prior on the space of functions. So when you train a neural network, there's all kind of implicit priors. So even using stochastic gradient descent is a prior. That is a prior that, uh, so I think when you train with stochastic gradient descent, it's like you are kind of regularizing the smoothness of functions. So there's like all kinds of priors that you are implicitly imposing when you use a neural network. And it turns out it's not a great prior for physics. So actually what is a, a better prior um, is uh, symbolic expressions. Like they're really good. We know they're good because all of our existing like uh, theoretical frameworks and empirical equations use them. Um, of course, like you can't really get to that level of complexity, um, but it is, uh, I mean, like some problems, it's really good to just use that prior. Um, sorry, that was a kind of a tangent, but happy to chat about that more. Um, so this is 
like it's a type of inductive bias or a prior over models. Like you're you're searching for models represented as a sparse combination of analytic operators. And if we think about like, okay, why is this? Um, why are plus multiplication exponential? Why are those good? Like, why is a sparse combination of those operators a good idea? Um, I think it's like, uh, because these operators have specific geometrical meaning or they're a solution to common differential equations. So like plus is kind of like you're translating in space. Maybe you're counting things. Multiplication is like going from length to area to volume. Um, exponential is a solution to common differential equations. Um, so there's a lot of kind of like, uh, there's good reason for these operators. And the universe has this kind of weird property where compositions of these operators tends to be like a good uh, prior for models. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really interesting. So analytic models often seem to generalize better than neural networks. I think just neural networks are like not a great physical prior, like especially like randomly initialized neural networks, not a great physical prior um, on a, uh, like physical relations. Okay, so symbolic regression, it's a uh, it's a machine learning task where the objective is to find analytic expressions that optimize some objective. Okay, so it was originally popularized by John Koza uh, in the in the nineteen nineties, who was kind of the first to apply genetic algorithms to this problem, um, and then Hod Lipson's group in the early 2000s kind of uh, started really applying this to uh, science. So the, the general idea here is you have an equation like say this, so y equals z plus two sine z, you represent it as a tree, and that is also represented as some relation in your data space, right? So you have like this curve maybe. Um, the, the idea here is that by exploring this space, um, you can kind of bring your equation closer to the true data set. Um, so it's a, it's a discrete problem. Um, now there are deep learning approaches to this, of course, but it's, uh, it seems to be like state of the art. So there's this, um, there's this annual symbolic regression, uh, competition. And I think this is the third year or the second year where a genetic algorithm has won, uh, which is kind of surprising because you get like these massive neural network approaches. Um, but genetic algorithms just seem like to generalize really well. Um, so the genetic algorithm is, it's a way of exploring this space by just like kind of doing mutations on these trees. So maybe like you switch an operator, um, maybe you kind of breed two equations together. So, you know, like this equation is a decent fit. This equation is a decent fit. And maybe you like mix parts of them. So you take this part, you swap it for the variable, um, and maybe you get a match. Um, so the objective is to jointly optimize accuracy and complexity. You try to find high accuracy, low complexity. Uh, complexity I'm happy to chat more, but it's kind of like this very abstract concept. Like, how do you define uh, simplicity? Um, it's it's user defined, so it's it's usually like usually just count the number of nodes in these trees. Um, so so I maintain um, two symbolic regression packages that are fairly mature now. So one is symbolicregression.jl. That is kind of like the the distributed uh, Julia backend of uh, this. It's it's a very traditional symbolic regression approach. So it's, it's basically a genetic algorithm uh, with uh, some different optimization strategies mixed in. Um, it's it's very traditional, um, and and part of the reason for that is it it generalizes really well to new problems where you have kind of like unexpected uh, scales or relationships. Um, so it doesn't even need like gradients to do uh, searches. 
Um, and then Picer is kind of like this, this higher level uh, sidekit learn wrapper around symbolic regression.jl. Um, so you could also, so I, um, I think last year, maybe I, I kind of split out the back end of these. So there's dynamic expressions.jl, which is kind of like the, the high performance equation evaluation scheme. So if you want to build like your own symbolic regression algorithm, or you have like ideas in this space, um, I would recommend using that. And then you don't have to write like a fast equation evaluation scheme. Um, dynamic quantities is kind of like, okay, if you want to have like very like physical units in your symbolic regression, uh, that's kind of like what you would want to use for fast uh, physical unit processing. Um, okay, so the the way this algorithm works, so this is Picer. It's a it's a pretty traditional algorithm with like a couple tweaks. So it's a what's called a multi-population evolution scheme. So you have this population here of expressions. So maybe you have like a hundred expressions. Uh, you could initialize them like usually you initialize them randomly. But you so you have like a hundred expressions. You randomly sample some of those. So maybe you sample like two expressions. Uh, I think I usually sample like ten expressions when I do this, but let's just say two. Of those two expressions, you compute the uh, fittest uh, expression. So maybe like you look at the accuracy of the expressions or the complexity of the expressions. Um, and then from that, you would say, uh, so you take the, the best expression from your subsample and maybe you do some kind of like perturbation. Okay, so you have like this equation, maybe you mutate it, maybe you like breed it with a different equation, maybe you do some algebraic simplification, or maybe you kind of like optimize the constants with like an actual uh, traditional optimizer. Um, once that's done, you get it out here and you kind of put it back into your population. Now, the traditional approach for doing this is you replace the uh, the worst equation in your population, but recently people have started doing what's called age regularization. You basically replace the oldest member of your um, population. So it's it's kind of like evolution. Like a lot of this process kind of mimics how like actual species evolve. So it's like, okay, you have like two members of a population kind of like battle it out and the winner kind of like, I don't know, the winner breeds and has like a new offspring and the offspring goes in uh, to the pool. And then maybe like the oldest member of your population dies off um, and you kind of like have a constant population. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a lot of the, the ideas here kind of pull from evolution and they seem to be like a decent uh, optimization strategy. Um, it, it's interesting because like deep learning, so there's there's deep learning approaches to symbolic regression. Um, they seem to have this problem where uh, they kind of can, can overfit a bit on the training set of equations. So like if you have equations that look a specific way in your data set, um, if you have like a completely different equation in the uh, like in the in the test set or something, um, it can be really hard to get it to generalize. Genetic algorithms are nice here because they don't have like any training data, right? They're just an algorithm. They're they're kind of like barely machine learning. Like they're not trained on anything. You, it's just like a it's an algorithm for doing uh, optimization basically. Um, so the okay, so the so that's like that's how the Picer kind of loop works. It's very standard symbolic regression strategy. Um, the way the so when I say multi-population, it's it's basically how this step works. So you have um, you have many different populations of equations. Maybe you have like one population sitting on each core of your computer. So you have like maybe you have like 64 cores and maybe a thousand equations in each population. That would be like 64,000 equations and they kind of live independently. Um, 
during the optimization loop, each island, you have like an island of equations here, it will evolve independently on a core. So they don't have to talk to each other. They're just kind of like evolving on a single core, kind of like mutating. Uh, and what you can see is that over the course of training, um, it's almost like they kind of like specialize. So maybe like one island here will be like exponentials. One island will be like polynomials. Uh, one island will be like trigonometry. Um, and so after you've kind of like evolved for a while, you can do migration between populations. So maybe you have like the best members from this purple island go to the blue island and the best members from the blue island go to the purple island. Um, and you kind of get this random asynchronous migration between populations. Again, this is kind of to mimic how actual evolution works. Um, and it, it seems to, to help a lot. And it's a good way to kind of get parallelism over as many cores as you want. So if you have 10,000 cores, you can just have like 10,000 uh, individual populations running and they kind of like send members to each other. Um, and you also have like this subset of like the best equations you've ever seen and that one you you maybe redistribute to the uh islands to kind of like get an aggregated result um okay so i'll just show a quick movie so this is a movie i spent way too long on and it was maybe not a good use of my time but i made it for you um and you can see it so let's say we have this true relationship here in orange that we want to fit. Um, and we have this equation x plus y. Okay, so this is represented by this tree. So let's kind of see how this happens. So a genetic algorithm is going to kind of randomly explore this space. So you see like all these different equations it's looking at. And this represents like different kind of draws in your population. Um, and so maybe you pick maybe the best one of those uh, kind of like the best step in the family tree. Um, and you get a different equation and that's maybe like a better fit. Then you keep searching the space. Maybe you like do mutations. So there's a separate constant optimization step that can happen here. So you see it's like... A, so once in a while, you kind of don't do a mutation, you kind of optimize the constant directly. Uh, maybe you add more nodes, do more constant optimization, and you kind of finally end up at your true um, equation. So again, the nice part about this, there's no training. It's just an algorithm. Uh, and I think this is why genetic algorithms tend to do well at these kind of like symbolic regression competitions where you don't know the uh, space of equations uh, beforehand because it's like you you really uh you're not training you're not really like relying on assumptions about the equations it's kind of like the it's just an algorithm for exploring this space um so i'm going to i'm going to play the movie again because i spent so long on it <laughs> you can watch it multiple times yeah so it's kind of like randomly exploring the space um mutating nodes breeding trees, um, yeah. So it's just like random perturbations to explore the space of expressions. Okay. So in code, I wanna show an example of like what the actual code looks like. So this is symbolic regression.jl. Uh, what we're gonna do here is find equations that fit a housing data set. Okay, so we're going to try to predict the price of a house uh, with symbolic regression. So what we do here is we kind of set up, so this is like Julia stuff. Basically, you set up some uh, network of, of worker nodes, uh, and then you import symbolic regression, uh, this machine learning package, MLJ. You define a custom loss function. So this is the nice part about genetic algorithms is you don't you don't really need any you don't even need like a differentiable 
uh, loss function. Like it can be an arbitrary loss function. You can even look at the symbolic properties of your equation. Okay, we define a model. We're going to say these are operators plus multiplication minus division. We are going to turn on multiprocessing where we have kind of predefined these processes. Um, and we're going to set up, these are just like different hyperparameters. Okay, so now we're going to make our uh, machine. And so this uses like the, uh, so this is the reduced Ames housing data set. Basically the, so we're trying to predict the house price from the greater living area. So the, the you know, the square footage of the house, the, the square footage, I think it's like the first floor, the basement square footage, the lot area, the number of car spaces in the garage, um, stuff like this, and the year built, okay? So we're gonna try to predict the housing price based on these factors. We create a machine and we can get started with this fit machine. And so basically if you have like workers spawned over like thousands of cores across a cluster, um, this will send out equations to all the worker nodes uh, and they'll kind of like all work together across this cluster. So you see it's starting searching. Um, and what we can see here, if I just pause, is this is the uh, Pareto front of equations. So it's kind of like, this is the best equation at this complexity, best equation at this complexity and so on. So you see the best equation at complexity of one is just a constant, which makes sense. Complexity three is the living area divided by a constant. I think that makes sense. So that's kind of like the, the housing price is correlated with the square footage. Makes sense. Um, if we let it train a bit longer, we can kind of get better expressions. Uh, so maybe I think I speed it up here. Let's see. So if I let it run a bit longer, uh, we can see kind of like maybe convergence a little bit. Okay, so the more complex expressions is like the area of the garage plus basement square footage plus living area divided by constant. Again, that kind of makes sense. Uh, some of the more complex relations. So this is like year built garage cars times basement square footage um, plus living area. So there's there's kind of like, it, it's starting to build up more complex expressions. Again, this is highly dependent on what operators you choose. You could use different operators here. Um, but it, again, this is just like a way of exploring expressions that fit a data set. Um, okay, cool. I see there's one question in the Slack. A oh, movie appreciated. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> Okay, there's also a Python API. So it is a Julia package, but I know like most people use Python. So I kind of use Julia as like an alternative to C because like a lot of the Python packages are written in C and then they have like Python wrappers like NumPy. Um, but I don't want to write this all in C++ because it would take me like 10 years. So I wrote it in Julia um, and then uh, so there's this package called PyJulia, which basically wraps Julia from Python. So that's what um, Pycer is. Pycer is a Julia wrapper around symbolicregression.jl. Uh, it's scikit-learn style interface. So you kind of have this regressor object where you declare the properties. So like these are the operators. Uh, you can define custom operators. They don't even need to be differentiable. They can be like if statements. They can do like bit shifts. They can do a lot of different things. So you can just define it like that. Just a string of Julia code that's going to be evaluated. Um, and then uh, you can define custom loss functions again. So this is like just mean squared error loss function. Um, but again, you can use an arbitrary loss function. You could use like a loss in log space if you want. Um, you could have like much more complex things. Okay. Uh, so you can also have dimensional constraints. So I think like this is something that people asked me to add for like two years. So I finally added it. Um, so there's this package dynamic quantities.jl, which is like really fast unit evaluations. So I added, so I made this to kind of get this all working. Um, 
basically, if you do model.fit, like a scikit-learn call, you can specify, okay, the X variables have these units. So like constants.msun, uh, kilograms, radius, earth units, um, and then the Y units you describe as well. Um, and this will just let the algorithm uh, enforce dimensionality constraints throughout the expression. So this is optional. If you don't enforce this, it just assumes like all the variables are dimensionless, which is fine. Um, I think in many cases that's, it doesn't really change the result, um, but it's, uh, if you do want dimensionality constraints, you can add it like this basically. Um, and the constants, it will basically assign like wildcard units. So like any constant it finds will uh, cancel out the units of variables uh, if it needs to. Or it can like, like if you have like A times mass plus length, um, the A variable or the A constant will kind of automatically have length over mass. Uh, it will kind of like calculate that on the fly. Um, so it will, but it, it still enforces dimensionality constraints. So if you have like mass plus length, obviously it's going to say, no, this is not allowed um, and move on. Um, you can also define custom objectives. So I think like two days ago, someone asked me like, can I make it so my equation has exactly two sinusoids? You can do that in, in symbolic regression.jl. So the loss function does not need to be differentiable. You can have gradients in the loss function. You can do uh, you can do like all sorts of things in the loss function. So this one, I'm like counting the number of sinusoids here in this equation. Uh, so this is like Julia code. Um, and then I'm adding a penalty of 10 for every sinusoid off from two. Uh, and, and so with this, this user was able to find equations that have like exactly two sinusoids, um, which is, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't understand why they want that, but you could do that <laughs> is, is my point. Um, and of course you can also have like custom loss functions as well. Okay, so in the Picer paper here, I have this kind of full breakdown of uh, comparison with different packages. So there's a lot of nice packages out there. Eureka is kind of the, the, the most famous method. So this is from Hod Lipson's group. It's unfortunately not open source and, and they charge a lot of money for it. Um, and I don't even think you could download it. It's like a online web service now. Um, but I think that's still like maybe the most powerful tool. Um, I kind of wrote Picer because I was so annoyed at not having people like be able to reproduce my symbolic regression stuff. Uh, so I wrote Picer. Um, so you could look at the full table in the paper. Basically, I just say, okay, this is like the, these codes are like compiled. These are multi-core, multi-node, GPU, uh, if there's like pre-training involved. So some of the deep learning approaches have that. Um, if there's like a SymPy interface, uh, custom losses, custom operators, custom complexity. Um, and so I kind of do like a full breakdown of the comparison. Uh, and the, so I link code for these if you wanna check out the other packages. Um, and I have this like very explicit like lock for the closed source packages. <laughs> There's no code for those, yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, I have like this uh, full breakdown. So there's like other packages too, obviously, but these are kind of the, the um, I think, yeah, these were like the, the um, I think these were in this competition. So I just compared against the ones in the competition. Okay, uh, so I also have this uh, actual like numerical uh, comparison uh, where I just see, okay, like if I take the original Hubble data set, which is like there's tons of scatter in the original Hubble data set, we don't know the constant, uh, which algorithms can find the original uh, equation. So this is like an exact recovery. So I had to look through every single equation by hand because if you do like SymPy based equality, it, it, it's like not accurate sometimes. Um, like SymPy will say two equations are different, even though they're just like 
one's a division, one's a multiplication of a constant. Um, so yeah, the, in summary, so the, the, so Pyser does well, except Planck's law and Rydberg. It seems like those are just really hard to get. Um, it could have been like the specific data set um, that I used, or maybe like, I don't know, but those, those were hard to get. So none of the algorithms got those ones. Um, and I think the closest was uh, UDSR, uh, which got a lot. The other one, which is good. So Operon is pretty good. This, so Operon is like, a, it's a linear. So it's, it's like you have a basis of expressions and you find like a linear combination of those bases. Um, but it's it's very good at that. Um, so I think some equations, so like the Schechter function, it got well, um, but like some things it struggled on. So I think like Hubble's law, it couldn't find. And I think this was because like, it was kind of surprising, like a lot of them couldn't find a linear relation, including the deep learning approach. Um, and I think this was just because like, there's so much scatter, you kind of, these algorithms will start fitting like sinusoids to it. Um, to Hubble's law. Uh, so you, you don't really get this like simplicity, accuracy curve that you should always kind of make. Um, but yeah, there's full, full results in the Pyser paper. Uh, and then, yeah, so I also have, so there's there's been a lot of research the past few years with Pyser. Um, and I have this list of user submitted papers. There's like, I, I think there's like, I don't know, I think there's like almost 50 papers now that use Pyser, but it's, it's uh, so this is like the user submitted papers. So there's like, oops, there's like, uh, there's some cool papers on, so they're trying to find like a cloud cover model. Um, there's uh, there's some Camels papers, of course. So this is from uh, Jay Wadakar, which is a nice paper. Um, I think this one's in PNAS now. Uh, Pablo Lemos's paper. Um, oops, and then um, some others. So I, yeah, I, I try to maintain like a list there. Um, and there's, yeah, there was recently like this cool relation where they discovered a black hole mass uh, scaling relation as a function of galaxy properties, which was like, had more properties than, um, than you would usually define. Uh, so that was a cool paper. So I, I would check out this list. Um, okay, so I'm almost out of time. So I'll just really quickly run through this idea. Um, symbolic, so symbolic regression is not only useful by itself to just like find equations, but um, you can also use it to kind of take a neural network and distill it into an expression. So this is actually kind of how I got into this uh, subject. Um, the way this works is you would, if you have like a neural network, you kind of like train it normally. Okay, you just train it on your problem. Then you stop training and you freeze the parameters. After that, you record the inputs and outputs of this network. So maybe you see like, okay, for this example in the training set, this is the output of this network. For this input, this is the output and so on. Um, and then you would maybe take those and fit them with Pyser or like a different symbolic regression package uh, if you want. Um, the equation that Pyser gives you or other symbolic regression package, you can kind of treat this as like a, it's kind of like a Taylor expansion on steroids in a way. And you can basically use that expression as an approximation of the neural network. Um, the first question people always ask me is like, okay, why not just do symbolic regression directly? So the reason is because you would usually have this single neural network that you're approximating as like a piece of a larger model. So maybe you have like two neural networks and maybe there's like a summation in the middle. And this is like the node model in a graph network. And this is like the edge model in a graph network. Uh, this is where this idea becomes powerful because now you can approximate this piece and then this piece uh, kind of separately. So maybe like the first network learns the features of the data 
and the second network like uses those features to do a calculation. Um, so maybe you would fit like, okay, this is the relations here uh, between between X and uh, Y, and you could like swap that in. And so again, this is like, it's like a Taylor expansion on steroids of a neural network. So you've kind of like found this expression that approximates this network. Um, you typically like retrain the second network to pick up approximation errors in uh, in the replacement of the first network. Um, and so you would do the same thing. Basically, like you fit the relation with symbolic regression, and then you replace it. Um, now, the what you should see here is that we've kind of like we've found a more complex expression that we might then we might be able to just by doing normal symbolic regression. So symbolic regression by itself, it scales poorly with complexity because it's a combinatoric problem. Uh, whereas neural networks, you can kind of like very easily find complex relations. So, but the, the key thing to, to note here is that like instead of say, fitting N expressions for F and N expressions for G simultaneously, which is N squared expressions. Now we're fitting N plus N. So it's 2N. So it's it's kind of like, it's factorized this problem into smaller pieces that you could then do symbolic regression on. Um, so this is the, the really attractive thing about this type of method is it lets you find symbolic relations for like more complex or higher dimensional uh, problems. So that's the the pitch. Um, okay, so I'm out of time, so I'll just flip to this. So yeah, um, this is kind of like, a, um, so if traditionally we are building theories that describe like low dimensional summary statistics, maybe in, the machine learning era, we could try doing this like neural network compression and then trying to like interpret the neural network with the theory. Um, maybe that's like an approach. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna skip through the rest of these. Uh, so this is like Pablo Lemos's nice paper that just got published. Um, and so, yeah, so I will stop there and I'll just like conclude with maybe some rhetorical questions like something people ask me is like a pure neural network approach to, to AI for science without any interpretation. Is that a possible strategy or would you get like worse generalization than if we have these kind of like explicit geometrical uh, biases? Um, so like, I think general relativity is a nice example because it was derived from only a few postulates, yet it can predict uh, like the existence of black holes. So is it is it kind of hopeless to expect that level of generalization from uh, machine learning, um, even like pre-trained foundation models? Um, so yeah. Um, okay, so I will stop there. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, sorry, again, I couldn't come in person, just teaching constraints, um, but I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you, Miles. Uh, there is already one raised question, like Torsten was really like a <laughs> trying to fight for it. <laughs> Thank you, very nice. I have a, a question or remark and then a provocative question. <clears throat> so let me see. <laughs> Give first a, a more technical question. Um, any neural network is a computational graph. Any formula is a neural network. So basically, you can take a neural network. Well, you mm -hmm. can write it down as a formula, right? You have activation functions, you have sums, you have multiplications. You can take a neural network and put it as one of your, uh, your equations and yeah. let it be this part of the optimization. So, yeah. so basically what you have described is a very nice way to prune networks or to sample over the, the space of network topologies and activation functions, isn't it? 
Uh, so in a way, so there's actually, so you raise a, a good point. So there's actually an algorithm that does this, which is really cool. So the algorithm is called Equation Learner. It's from George Martius in uh, Germany, his group. It's literally basically what you described. Like it is a neural network where for the activation functions, they use the operators. So like if your operators are like sine and cosine and plus multiplication, those would be the activation functions. You then train it with a sparsity regularization and the final result is kind of like an equation, um, like a simple equation. So the, the, the key difference is like the activation functions, you would have to choose the operators, right? So like if you, like obviously you're not gonna want an equation with a bunch of ralu activations. It, it, it's like a piecewise linear, um, but the, so in practice it doesn't really, uh, it's kind of like numerically unstable. Um, so I haven't had good luck. Like I, I think it, I, I really wanted it to work because I think it's like a really nice idea. Um, but in practice, like, it's really sad. Like, this is the, the sad part about symbolic regression. Like, there's all these exciting ideas, but at the end of the day, genetic algorithms are just like, they're like this 40 year old idea that just like always generalizes better. <laughs> it's kind of sad. Um, but, uh, yeah, so equation learner is basically what you describe. Uh, it is kind of like you are. This is why I made the analogy to like a Taylor expansion. Like you're, you're kind of doing this uh, sparsity approximation. The difference is like the operators you, you choose wouldn't necessarily be the activation functions because you don't want your activation function to be like an exponential because that would just like totally mess up training. Like the, the linearity of activation functions, um, like, like a ReLU is actually really important for stable training. Uh, and yeah, but the other thing is if you just did sparse training, you don't really get this Pareto curve of like, this is the best expression at this complexity, best expression at this complexity. You kind of, it's just kind of like a one shot pass. Like, okay, if we just remove this parts of the equation, this part and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah I don't know if you, I answered your question. Maybe, yeah, but, maybe we can um, jump to the next question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> hi, Miles. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, this is Ben Giblin from Edinburgh speaking. Um, so the, the bit where you showed how the different symbolic regression codes that exist, some of them got the uh, physical laws like Hubble right and, and others didn't. I, I'd be yep. interested in hearing your thoughts about why the, some of them, or, or PISA in particular, failed for some of the laws. Because if I were to run PISA on my data set where I, I don't know the underlying physical uh, laws or expression that describe the, the relation between input and output, it's like, how will I know if I'm going to get the right equation? Or does my data set have properties similar to, say, the Hubble data set where it doesn't, it doesn't get the right answer? So I was wondering if you have an insight on that. Yeah, so I guess I'll make a couple of comments. The first is, it really depends on what you're actually after. So usually there's no true expression. Like even, so in the, in the Newton's Law of Gravity paper with Pablo Lemos, like uh, that is not the true relation. The true relation, I mean, to first order is general relativity. Um, so it's important to think like, what are you actually after? Usually what I think we are after is I want a simple interpretable expression that is like reasonably accurate. Um, so there's like different objectives that exist. So one is like computational complexity if I want a very fast approximation. Maybe I want it to be simple uh, for that purpose. Um, uh, yeah, and I guess the, so it's it's kind of like a user-defined metric, like what you actually care about. The reason I think some of the packages fail to find like even really simple relations is just their training data. Because some of those were, were um, deep learning algorithms. And I think their training data maybe didn't have the right uh, noise statistics because it's like it's really hard to get. Like I think I think it's kind of like an impossible problem to pre-train a network to do symbolic regression because the space of possibilities is just so vast. 
Um, whereas a uh, genetic algorithm, it's, it's not really even machine learning. Like you're just, it's just an algorithm to explore the space. It's kind of like a normal optimization algorithm. Um, so, and I think the, so the, I think the reason Pyser and all the other algorithms struggled with say Planck's law, um, like this is a problem for genetic algorithms in general is if your solution exists in a very tiny minima where, so like Planck's law, if there's like any change from the original um, uh, Planck equation, it's basically like completely different uh, output. So it's like this very poorly conditioned problem where you have to basically get Planck's law exactly correct Otherwise, um, you're kind of like way off. So what happens is if you look at the outputs, it's kind of like uh, you just get approximations of, of Planck's law. So you don't get the exact specific uh, formula, but you get kind of like a, approximations which maybe have some of the, the uh, horse behavior. Um, so obviously like this is not, um, like that is problematic. And I think if you were, if you were to apply this to a problem where you don't know the true relation, I mean, it's it's important to always consider like, okay, what do you actually want? Do you actually want like the true equation? Because often there is no true equation. It's always like an interpretable accurate equation up to some level of complexity. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it just depends kind of what you're after, but then to know if you've actually found it, uh, is a is a different story. So I think like one thing you could do is just do convergence testing. So just like run a genetic algorithm multiple times with different random seeds and see like if you find the same equation, then it might not be like the best possible equation because that's almost an impossible question to answer. I mean, it's an infinite search space. Um, but I think that's like a good as a good measure as any um, that you've kind of like settled on something. Um, okay. Okay, thanks, Max. Yeah. We have uh, two more questions, and then we'll probably stop. So, Declan first. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, Declan Bartlett from IEP. Oh, hey. Um, hey. Um, <laughs> so, I've got a, a few com comments. Uh, first of all, an operon, uh, just as a correction, that yeah. is actually genetic programming rather than um, a linear combination okay, of yeah. functions. Um, yeah. But I think there was a... Uh, the, I don't know what I said. Yeah, uh, Yeah, I think you were talking about... Um, uh, I've, I can't remember. I think it's called equation search. But anyway... Um, so I think it's a mix. So Operon is, is just definitely genetic like, programming. But anyway, can I move on to yeah. the, the main yeah. point, which I think was kind of, I, I think you kind of ran out of time to talk about it, and it probably would have come up in the Pablo Lemos paper. Um, and it's related to the previous comment about picking the best equation, right? This is kind of part of the, the thing that there was a comment by Francois Lanousse yesterday evening in the debate about how with symbolic regression, one of the problems is that you always end up with these um, expressions that are very nested functions or uh, contain lots of uh, you know, semi-arbitrary things. Uh, so I think an important part of symbolic regression, like for example in PISA, you have a method for computing the best function because there's some trade-off between accuracy and simplicity. Um, so there you have this score method. Um, and one reason I think that some algorithms do particularly poorly is not because they're searching the space poorly, but they ha just have a wrong um, method for choosing the best equation. So, for example, Operon in the uh, example you're giving, there was a paper this year by Bogdan Berlaku who showed that if you change from just picking the most accurate equation to some more principled method of balancing accuracy and simplicity, uh, you can do uh, a lot better. So I think that's an important thing to remember. And actually, there's a, in the thread from Monday's talk by Tanachi, there's some comments about this. Um, but maybe like I want to ask a question about uh, when you say there's not really training, there's not really machine learning. I mean, I mean these for, are me, like, for, for me, like, you know, well, when I say training, it's just a yeah. fancy word for optimizing parameters. And here you're yeah. just optimizing functions. So I feel like it's slightly like, like misleading the, to say so you're I, not. I like, yeah, yeah. Training, like the, it's still an optimization. Puts it, which is uh, machine learning is when you are fitting a model and you don't know what the parameters mean physically. That's like, I, I think he said it in jest, but it's like, I think that's a very good uh, way of putting it. So when I say it's not really machine learning, I mean like it's not like, um, 
I mean, I don't even know what I mean, but it, it's, it's not like you are uh, maybe using reinforcement learning Monte Carlo tree search to search this space. Like a genetic algorithm solves this machine learning task, but with like a very principled algorithm rather than using reinforcement learning. I think that's, that's kind of more what I meant is like, yeah. Or I guess, well, I guess my direction is machine learning, but the algorithm itself is kind of just like not trained. Yeah. But you're, you're, you're obtaining a fit based on data, which for me just feels like training. Um, no, so I guess uh, so what I'm saying is that the task of finding an equation is machine learning as you, I think, agree. The way you find that equation uh, is, is kind of like a, a traditional algorithm, whereas there's other approaches in symbolic regression, just to differentiate, like there's other approaches in symbolic regression which use reinforcement learning to search the space and are pre-trained on other data, um, if that makes sense. So it's, it's, it's kind of like these other approaches are using machine learning to build a machine learning solver, whereas this one is like a genetic algorithm is handwritten. There's no pre-training of that genetic algorithm. Like it's coded and then it runs and solves a machine learning task. Okay, that makes My, okay Miles, thanks. Uh, yeah. We have one last question. Uh, let's try to do it quick. Yeah, I'm going to be fast. <laughs> Hi, Miles. It's Louisa Lucy Smith. So okay. uh, I, I wanted to, I mean, I guess it's a related question, but more tied to the interpretability, right? I think that the issue is complexity is quite crucial, right? Because if you have, you know, you're in a setting where you can find a simple analytic expression, then we're probably good enough as scientists ourselves to figure out whether it's a power law or some cosine or something like that. And then if you move on to a more complex scenario, then you start having these complicated analytic expressions that are nested, as, as people were saying before, which to me isn't that different from the neural network itself, right? That is also some nested combination of sums and multiplications and other things. So how do you basically balance these two things in, in your, in using symbolic, in, in, uh, symbolic regression for interpretability because I think once you're in the mm -hmm. complexity in the complex scenario you lose interpretability just by having these complex analytic expressions basically yeah so the way I define it is you should always define complexity so if you're using it for interpretability you should define complexity as how hard it is for you to interpret this model um, so that's why you should choose operators that exist in your existing models. Uh, and you should kind of define complexity as like, okay, how complex would this be to interpret? So if it's like nested power laws, obviously that's gonna be complicated. So I wanna maybe assign super high complexity to that. Um, if there's like a lot of, like maybe, I think addition is less complex than logarithms uh, to me. So I would kind of define complexity lower for that. Um, but I mean, I think you can, yeah, I think you can get um, uh, pretty far with that definition. And I like, I mean, so there, there's some nice papers that actually do this explicitly. So there's a paper from Roger Gamera, uh, who's in, uh, uh, I forget his institution, but they have this paper called the Bayesian Machine Scientist. It's basically a symbolic regression algorithm where they do MCMC sampling uh, in the space of equations. And it's, uh, they define the, I think they define the likelihood based on like existing equations. So they basically scraped Wikipedia, counted the number of different operators, and then use that as like the prior on operators. So I think it's like a very explicit way or a very explicit uh, kind of setup to what I'm basically arguing uh, now. It's like uh, you should define complexity based on what you find complex, uh, because like that's the point of interpretability. And your language is existing operators, so that's how you should define complexity. Thanks. So like obviously, okay. if you're in biology, you wouldn't start using dialogarithms even though that is an analytic operator, like 
it's just it's dial logarithm does not appear in any biological formula. So it's not really interpretable to them. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, so okay. um, thanks again for the presentation and hopefully keep it around.